Good morning and welcome to this, the 23rd meeting of 2014 of the European and External Relations Committee. I'm going to make the usual request that mobile phones are switched off, please. Um, moving on swiftly to agenda item one, um, I'd like to welcome Adam Ingram, MSP, to the European and External Relations Committee. And, uh, Adam, I would um, ask you if you have any interest to declare in relation to this committee. No, I don't. Uh, no, I have no relevant interest to declare, convener. Thank you very much. I um, would like to formally welcome you to the committee, Adam, and put on record our thanks to Claire Adamson, who, um, as Hans Alla has already said, came to committee very, very well prepared and, and wish her well in the, the new committees that she's taken part in. Okay, moving on to agenda item two is a decision to take business in private, which is a decision to take agenda item seven in private, which is our work programme, which is the usual process. Has the committee Agreed. agreed? agreed. Okay, agenda item three is a report from the Committee of the Regions. As you know, we have uh, two members of the Parliament who are uh, our Committee of the Regions representatives. One is uh, Stuart Maxwell and the other one is Patricia Ferguson, MSP. And you have your um, report in uh, your papers this morning. I think it's paper number one. Um, any comments, questions? Queries. The report this time is compiled by Patricia Ferguson. Um, Patricia and Stuart take turn about to compile this report. So, um, as I say, the report's there. Any um, questions or comments? Willie. Thanks very much, Convener. I mean, the, the, the report, the agenda for the meetings looks uh, fairly extensive and very interesting. And there's a number of subjects there that have came up at this committee for our members' interests, for example, climate and energy, TTIP is there, the blue economy, uh, you know, the potential of developing the seas and so on, reconnecting Europe's uh, ICT issues. So there's a whole load of things in the agenda there. I just wondered if there's any detail on the deliberations of the committee from the member that could, in terms of the contribution that was made and the discussions that took place that we might actually benefit from. I wonder if we could perhaps seek that and get more information on some of this. Yeah, if, if there are specific items, yes, we can, we can raise that. Is it specifically the ones maybe that are of interest to this committee right now, whether there has been any? I mean, those are the ones that, that occur to me as being interesting that have come up here, but other members may have other areas there. I mean, there's a 40 odd items are covered during the two plenaries, I think, that are mentioned there, but it's really just the agenda we've got. I was just, once just wondering what actually happened during discussions of some of those items and whether our member could, could give us some kind of information on what thinking is and what development plans there, there may be there to, to bring these matters to our attention. So okay. If that was possible, convener, I'm sure that would be of benefit to the committee. Yeah, thanks. So. Any other comments? Rod? Uh, so I'll just make a comment under the Justice and Home Affairs in, in relation to the comments made by the m members of the European Parliament's Women's Rights and Gender Equality Committee calling for more EU level action on gender violence um, and uh, a new strategy published in 2015. The Council of Europe, um, kind of the arm of the European Convention as it were, uh, has obviously an Istanbul Convention. I think it would be helpful uh, if we could find some kind of... Uh, brief summary of that uh, for the committee and consider that in terms of its overlap with what's happening uh, in the European Union in terms of gender violence. It's quite an interesting area. Okay. <coughs> Do you have any other comments on the, the Committee of the Regions report? Um, so we're looking for some additional information on decisions and discussions. Yeah some um, future time want to suggest as committee that we explore that area, but I think we, we need some more information okay. over that first. Okay, thank you. Any more comments? Adam. Now, do you have um, any sessions with the Committee of the Region's members, uh, Ms Ferguson and Mr Maxwell? Does the committee actually We, we have offered... We, we, we invite them to, to deliver the report. Um, in some occasions, that's most occasions, that's not been 
practicable for them um, because of sitting on other committees and things at the same time we sit. Um, but certainly that's why we wanted the report. I think uh, Willie's point's pertinent. You know, it's, it's good having the agenda, yeah. but what contributions took place, what happened, you know. Yeah, well, for example, with the, the TTIP um, discussions that, that we're having, it might have been interesting if um, either one or the other had come along and sort of given us a flavour of the debate that's happening in Europe in the Committee of the Regions yeah. just to... That might inform us a little bit in terms of Well, we're of still what we're continuing with our inquiry and TTIP well into yeah. the, the new year, so that's maybe something we can look at. Um, either some written evidence, or as you say, if they can make it along to committee to give us mm -hmm. a flavour of what's happened at committee, the region's level. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's yeah, a good, a good particularly idea. Particularly in terms of sub state level and how people are responding to Yes, yeah, cities and regions, and yep, indeed, indeed. Point well made. Yeah. Okay. I think I agree. I think um, at least one of the, the members should really be here to assist us in getting the flavour, as you quite rightly point out. I think it's important that uh, we should have had at least one member in attendance. Uh, perhaps we could extend an invitation to them next time, saying that, you know, uh, it was felt at committee that somebody's uh, presence would have been appreciated. Yeah. We always do invite Hans, Hans Haller, but uh, what we'll do is uh, just impress that point. Please, yeah. I, th yeah. I think just sending us a report in itself is unreasonable to try and ask, extract the, the, the actual uh, flavour of what's being done and what difficulties, if any, they had faced and uh, how we could assist them in, in maximising what they're doing as well. I think it's I think it's, a, it's, it's something that we would want from them, but also for them to get something from us as well. So it would be a two-way traffic. Yep. Okay. Bully. Notice that each of the items, there's a rapporteur associated with mm -hmm. those as well. Are we entitled to uh, make contact with those people and similarly ask them for their summation as well? If that will give us more of a European perspective on... Yeah, good that, idea. That we, can, we, can, we can ask. Yeah, yeah definitely. Okay. okay, is that completed with the Committee of the Regions report? Yeah, excellent. Yeah, yeah. Um, happy to circulate to relevant committees. Maybe highlighting some of the points that we've, we've pulled out, yeah. Okay. Well, so that's, that's exactly, I think that reinforces the view of attendance, I think uh, that would be really useful because any it input that would be added to the report at committee would be a, another useful tool for other committees to get, rather than just getting a bland report as it is. Yeah. Okay, thank you. <coughs> Agenda item four is uh, your next paper, which is a paper on uh, their usual uh, reports um, from the Scottish Government. Um, on the work that, that they are doing, um, generally EU structural funds, Horizon 2020, our foreign languages, interests that we have on this committee, and any transposition of um, directives. So. so, we've got paper number two. Willie. In, in relation to the structural and investment funds, it, will we see the breakdown of, you know, on page five there it tells you there's 900 million euros coming to Scotland over a period of years and so on. Will we, will we get to the point where we might see a breakdown of where that money goes and what projects it relates to and so on? Again, I refer to my our friend and colleague Kelly Reedy who raised this regularly <laughs> to be able to get some kind of insight as to how the money is dispersed and shared out across various projects in Scotland. Will we be able to see that through that programme, do you think? Um, <clears throat> I think we can ask for it. I think what's happened is bec mm. because it's taken such a long time for the structural funds to kick into place, then some of the programmes are just starting now. Mm. Um, so, yeah, it's something maybe we can, we can look at. We, we ask for these reports every six months now, so yeah. hopefully you know, a pattern will, will, will emerge, um, especially when things are moving on. Um, but certainly it's something to keep you know, on the the front burner really on yeah. where, where's okay how much money are we get and where yeah. is it being spent and what's the outcomes of that yep. yeah yep. yeah alec 
when the Minister gave evidence on the budget, one of the questions that we did put to her was around the different European funds that were coming into Scotland. Um, and I think one of the concerns we had is that there's different parts of government that are involved. The Minister also said it was difficult to clarify what funding was coming into Scotland that was not directly coming in through government, but that she would endeavour to go and look at that and talk to other um, departments of government. I'm just wondering if, if we're able to follow that up and see if there's, there's been some progress there, because I do think it's an area that we need to actually look at. No, I think, I think you're absolutely right, Alex. And before uh, last year, what we managed to get was basically a chart of each portfolio, where the money went in, what it was spent on, and whether there was any washback or, or unspent funds as well. It, was, um, it took a while for that to be populated, but um, it did give us some of that information on where money went to. Um, and how it was spent, what type of programmes it was spent on. Um, but it's certainly something we can ask for again. But I do know the Minister was keen. She yeah, expressed yeah. the view that she was keen to try and see what could be pulled together. And I think that gives us a bit of picture because the question is, I suppose, are we taking advantage as local authorities, as other organisations taking advantage of the types of funding that could be pulled into Scotland? And the answer to that seems to be we don't know. So I think we need to do more on it. Because yeah, one, one of the question marks is, is local authorities in their own right apply to European funds as well, you know, and that maybe never come near, oh, never come near sorry, the Scottish Government at all. Um, so that, that's a bit sharing that information as well. And I think we spoke to COSLA in the past about that, but certainly something we can, we can chase up. Sorry, Hansel. Rod. And that, uh, in terms of our languages inquiry, that I was pleased to see that there has been a 45% increase in the number of modern languages assistants uh, in schools uh, since that started. So at least that's a positive sign. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions about the Scottish Government report? Willie. Thanks again, Convener. It's just on page 16 and 17 there. It's in relation to the the foreign language learning aspect, but the GLO online facility, you'll notice, members will notice that GLO was uh, successfully transitioned to this new flexible cloud-based environment. And the GLO is an online learning environment full of resources for teachers and pupils and, and parents alike. And I'm just saying I'm, I'm pleased to, to see it being used more widely. It was a subject to some criticism a, a couple of years ago, but I'm, I'm quite pleased to see that it seems to be developing into the, the useful tool that we all hope that it's going to be for, for kids and teachers in education. Yeah, yep, definitely. Any other questions on the Scottish Government reports? Okay. Transposition of directives. I think um, we're still chasing up on the trafficking directive, ensuring we're getting the most up-to-date information on that. And I think there's an interim report due from the trafficking um, European, Commission, European Commissioner's Department. So um, <coughs> we'll keep our eyes open for that. Certainly since... Um, it seems to be that the human trafficking bill will be imminent. It's went from soon to shortly, and Scottish Government speaks, so <laughs> I'm hoping it's, it's imminent. Evidence sessions planned in the Justice Committee will be taking evidence from stakeholders on it, so oh. imminent, I think, is very much the word. Excellent. Thank you very much for that information, Rod. It's the benefit of having the Justice Rapporteur mm. on the Europe Committee. <laughs> okay, happy to move on. Yeah. We've got the Brussels Bulletin, which is agenda item five. Um, again, any questions or comments? A few things I'm not up. Good. Those who haven't already spotted it, the comments I made about gender violence were in relation to the Brussels Bulletin, not the Committee of the Regents report. So I think I should correct that for the record. I did realise that, but I didn't want to correct you in mid flow. <laughs> <laughs> Any other comments? But, um, Alec. Convener, um, under the shipping emissions, um, again in terms of Rosyth, there was obviously the, the question of the, the emissions regulations and, and the impact that was going to have. And my understanding is, what I've read in the press, is that the Scottish Government have um, successfully um, negotiated a way forward with the company and Fourth Ports. 
and I did raise this with the Minister and I just wonder if we can perhaps follow up and, and get a report back on, on where that is at and what the Scottish Government position is. In terms of the employment skills and education, um, the, the, the speech by the Commissioner for Employment, Social Affairs, Skills and Labour Mobility, it would be quite good to get a, a copy or a link to that speech and also maybe some more information about the, the growth and investment package um, and the European Social Fund and, and, and how those are being used or how that relates to us here in Scotland rather than, than just the general, the general um, stuff with that. Um, and there was also this report in terms of um, informal learning and Scottish credit and qualifications framework. Again, it would be quite good to get that report, if possible. Okay. All of that. I've got all of that. Could you set up for you? Adam. <coughs> I was interested in a, um, a paragraph or two on the energy union, the European wide energy union, and it's obviously particularly relevant to Scotland um, notions of decarbonisation of the European energy mix and further investment in research and innovation, which is particular relevance to the announcement. Um, this past week of a couple of our wave power companies being in trouble um, and indeed European state aid rules were uh, mentioned in that context as well so it would be useful maybe to get some sort of uh, indication of how Scotland will play into this, this particular um, feature. Okay, so yep. if we could maybe get something back from whoever, Scottish Government or whoever on this particular subject. Yep. Yeah, we've got, we've got that. Any other comments on the Brussels Bulletin? Willie? Thanks, Kavir. It's on page four there in that creative industries section. That, that This, I think, came up at our committee previously where there seemed to be opportunities for media companies throughout the European Union and Scotland in particular to, to exploit some of the initiatives going on here. My question was really to ask how, how do our SMEs or our organisations that might have an interest in this be made aware of this? Is there any way we can get this Brussels bulletin out to a wider audience? I'm sure it's online and it's posted and so on, but signposting these things is often the key step to finding out anything. <laughs> You know, I'm sure our companies, local companies, would be interested in this kind of initiative. Yeah, Katie's just reminded me that the last time this was raised, we, we raised it directly with, with the organisations. Um, uh, obviously, Scotland Europe is very limited in the, the scope that it's got and in, in contacting people. But certainly, the, this, this committee and the work that it does can, can do some of that as well. But yeah, maybe just, you know, as you say, signposting. Um, it's always been an issue when we've talked about any European funding that, that comes through, through Scotland and how do people get access to it, how do they know it's there. Um, that raised awareness situation. I know that Scottish Enterprise do a bit of that, um, and certainly Scotland Europa do a bit of that as well, but um, maybe it's a bit more incumbent on us all to do a bit more in raising awareness. But we can do the direct are initiatives about exploiting and protecting and preserving our cultural heritage throughout Europe. So there, there's, there's bound to be an absolute mountain of material that's around that, that probably isn't digitised and protected for future generations. And there's lots of companies, not only in Scotland, but I'm sure throughout the European Union that would really like to participate in something like this. But to find out, first step in finding out that it's possible to, to become involved is a key step for them, I think. So anything that raises awareness amongst our companies in Scotland that there's potential here for them, I think would be welcome. Well, in that sector, then the, the sector skills council skill set would maybe be the, the place to go because they obviously work with lots of, you know, individual, uh, very very small companies up to, to larger companies as well. So that's maybe a, a route to go. Skill sets, the creative industries um, sector skills council. Yeah, yeah. Hans Alan. I'm just thinking. This should be on the website anyway. Sorry, should be on the website anyway. Um, so that, that in itself would help. But I, I, I know where you're coming from in terms of <coughs> excuse me, sharing it with uh, the industry itself. It, it might be an idea of sharing it with uh, 
um, Scottish enterprise and Scottish heritage and people like that as well. So we can share the, the linkage and we can make sure that their websites carry it as well. So that's another way of doing it, I suppose. But we would probably have to have a conversation with them in regards to sharing this type of information in the future. So it's a good point to bring up. I think it's, it's worthy of chasing up. Okay. Any other comments on a Brussels bulletin? No, I just wanted to raise very quickly on, on the very first page is the Juncker investment plan, um, which states quite categorically now that this is not new money, it's repackaged money, whereas I think the last time we discussed this, we thought this was new money. Um, so that's, that's an interesting uh, um, you know, insight into that. Um, but also the fact it looks like it's going to be focused on infrastructure, but it doesn't really de de define infrastructure, whether that's capital projects or digital infrastructure, for instance. Um, so maybe you know, keeping a close eye on uh, where Mr Juncker is going with his repackaged money, but also the fact that um, the European Investment Bank will take a much bigger interest in this and the whole um, package of match funding, I think, seems to be much more reliant on private investment too um, and then the impact that maybe have on the access of local authorities and other third sector organisations to, to get involved in that. But maybe just something we keep a their eye on and, and ask for some uh, deeper detail on what the plan is. Okay, happy to leave the Brussels, bu Brussels Bulletin at that point and bring it to the attention of the relevant committees across the Parliament. Thank you very much. Um, I think we're going to suspend for a few minutes to allow um, our visitors to take their seats for the round table. Um, if maybe we'll give it five minutes, I think, and allow people to get settled. So back in your seats for 9.27. Thank you.
Um, welcome back to the European and External Relations Committee, uh, moving on to our agenda item 6, which is the second evidence session in our inquiry on the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership, commonly known as TTIP. Um, we have a number of guests for our round table today, and what I uh, uh, intend to do is just to go round the table to allow people to introduce themselves and very, very briefly uh, give us um, the, the, you know, the reason why um, your organisation or, or your industry or, or your sector is, is interested in this topic. Um, obviously, I'm Christina McKelvey. I'm the uh, convener of, uh, of the committee. And if um, I c we would quite like to get a bit of a free flow of conversation around the table. So uh, if you can just channel maybe your comments through me, keep an eye on me. I'm pretty good at picking folk up and making sure that everybody gets their say. And if you sit too quietly, I will come and say, have your say as well, because I don't want you to go away and think that you've not um, had um, a decent opportunity to participate in this. We're very, very keen to get um, everybody's um, views on this, this issue. It's something the committee and MSPs in particular have been lobbied very, very heavily on. We had trade unions, third sector and uh, world development movement, NFU organisations like that two weeks ago. So now we're looking to see what the trade side uh, is saying um, and we're very, very keen to hear from you. So as I said, I'm Christina McKelvey. I'm Hansel Amalek, I'm the Deputy Convener and I'm uh, MSP for Glasgow Region. Uh, Scott Johnson, I'm the Chief Executive of Scottish Life Sciences Association. Adam Ingram, MSP for Carrick, Cumnut and Doon Valley in Ayrshire. Uh, David Breckenridge, Chief Executive of the Scottish Textile and Leather Association. Uh, Roderick Campbell, MSP for North East Fife. Benny Hartop, Managing Director of Hoyt Natua. I'm Willie Coffey, MSP, Comarnock, Northern Valley. Good morning, I'm John Crawford, I'm Strategy Manager at Scottish Enterprise. Hi, I'm Am Alec Browley, the MSP for the Cow and Beef Constituency. Uh, good morning, my name is David Williamson. I'm the Government and Communications Director at the Scottish Whiskey Association. Uh, good morning, Alan Hogarth from the Scottish North American Business Council and also representing ILD Scotland this morning as well. Good morning and, and, and welcome, um, you all. Can I thank you for uh, some of the written evidence that we got? That's extremely helpful in allowing us to to deliberate on the, on the questions, but maybe I'll just open uh, with a, a bit of a general question um, and ask you all if you can comment on it, is, is to give you know, the committee an insight into um, your thoughts on the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership and the, the benefits and the pitfalls of the partnership. Yep. Yeah. Um, Maybe just by way of introduction, the Scotch Whiskey Association represents 57 different member companies. That's about 95% of the Scotch whisky uh, industry. Um, we're a very internationally oriented uh, business, as um, members will be well aware. And the United States is our largest export market already by value, uh, our second largest uh, by volume. It represents about one pound in every five pounds that Scotch whisky earns around the world. So it really matters to us. Uh, it also matters to the Scottish economy because Scotch whisky is about 20% of all Scottish exports to the United States. So um, the industry has been following TTIP uh, very closely. Uh, indeed, we've been speaking to the European Commission and UK government about this since even before uh, the TTIP negotiations started to, to make sure that uh, our priorities were being reflected. Um, it's, a, it's an interesting uh, negotiation for us because our usual FTA issues, uh, tariffs, taxes, uh, the legal protection of Scotch whisky aren't actually at stake. Uh, we've already got a zero tariff in the US, there's a, a non-discriminatory tax and Scotch whisky is very well protected in, in federal law and in international law. And so the negotiation has become for us about um, less sexy issues like behind the border issues, technical regulation, regulatory coherence. Uh, and taking this opportunity, if at all possible, to set a, a precedent, uh, you know, get a benchmark in place for future trade negotiations, which frankly would probably be more commercially significant to us and where we face uh, more trade barriers. I'm thinking, for example, the, the EU FTA with India, which is being looked at at the moment. The other thing I think, that, I mean, we can go into some of the detail of our priorities as the meeting goes on, of course, but the other thing I think for us today is to, to really stress from a whisky industry perspective is that it's not just about the United States, this negotiation. Uh, for us, this is a much wider strategic issue because if we get it right with TTIP, 
and we have an ambitious deal. We actually have the opportunity to set ambitious deals with other trading partners, with India, with Vietnam, with Japan. These are negotiations that are going on at the moment. So you get a gold standard in place, you can apply that elsewhere. I think the final point at this juncture would be to say it's already having an impact. Uh, we're very clear that uh, only through TTIP starting did we get over the line with the EU-Canada deal, the Comprehensive Economic and Trade Partner uh, Agreement, CETA. It, it's meant that the Mexicans suddenly have become very interested in refreshing their FTA with the EU because they don't want to get left behind. And that's a very important emerging market for Scotch whisky. Um, Brazil, a, a market that's been teetering on the brink of recession for a, for a period of time, has started to look again at dormant trade negotiations with the EU for the wider Mercosur region. So this is an important deal both in terms of exports to the US, um, and there, there are potential commercial benefits there uh, through that gold standard, but we also have to have a, a wider perspective, and it's having an impact in other negotiations that are on the go and potentially could be very significant in terms of setting that standard elsewhere. Thank you, Alan Walker. Just to up what David said, I think. The opportunity is a once-a-generation chance to try and reach an agreement. Scotland's a small country trying to raise as much income as it can to pay for public services. The First Minister outlined last week the importance of growing the economy. TTIP provides that opportunity. Small businesses are crying out to try and break into that market. One of the issues, the tariffs, the tariffs there's £1 billion a, a year that UK businesses pay in tariffs currently. Um, but the real, the real prize is also trying to remove duplication of regulations. For example, a soft furnishing company who manufactures cushions or mattresses has a burn test that has to, to satisfy Brussels. So they, so they put together the kit, it burns, <coughs> it's safe. Then if they want to import to San Francisco, they have to go through the same rigmarole again. Um, and there's lots of examples of which, which many can bring up. So if we can try and get regulation tackled, the opportunities to small companies is huge. And the appetite out there is, is big as well. We've held five um, road shows across Scotland with over 250 companies along to them. So some of the misguided talk by trade unions and NGOs about TTIP needs to be addressed head on, to be honest. Okay, thank you. David Brickenbridge, and I believe you had quite an arduous journey to get here this morning, so thank, <laughs> thanks for getting here. <laughs> it was uh, an interesting journey, let's, let's put it that way. Um, yeah, if I could just perhaps, uh, from the perspective of the uh, textile and leather uh, industry here in Scotland, uh, just contextualise really what this uh, is all about and, and where our industry sits uh, with regards to the United States. Um, altogether in Scotland, uh, our industry employs uh, just short of 10,000 people, and that's directly employed, that's not including the indirectly employed uh, in ancillary uh, industries. Uh, we have a, a combined turnover that's, uh, in the region of £1 billion, uh, producing a, a GVA of uh, around £350 million. Uh, of that turnover, about 375 million is exported. Now, uh, the thrust of our strategy, and we, we have a, a strategy in place in the industry that, that takes us through uh, beyond 2015. We're currently working on a, on a new strategy. <coughs> but quite clearly, uh, the impetus for growth is going to come through, or we would expect it to come through, uh, export markets. Uh, our industry now uh, has uh, reached a, a, a particular stage, if you like, in its evolution, uh, where it's very, very much at the high added value uh, end of the spectrum. Uh, we produce really top quality uh, fabrics, top quality uh, garments, apparel, uh, and so on. So typically our customers would be some of the major global brands like Louis Vuitton and Hermes and these sort of people. Um, and those actually, uh, those products will go into these particular customers and then be exported all over the world from, uh, from their, their, those particular markets, uh, really from France and, and primarily. But what we are, we are doing in Scotland uh, at the moment is uh, very, very much developing uh, a brand identity of our own. Uh, and that is going to be central to uh, our uh, growth in the future. Uh, and looking at certain markets, uh, it's, it's clear where the potential lies for that growth. Uh, so the Far East, Japan in particular, despite its economic problems, is still a hugely important market to us. Uh, China is, uh, everyone talks about China, and China is potentially, again, a huge market. But that's a long, long way to go for us in terms of, uh, of development. 
Uh, the United States is the obvious one. It's the biggest luxury goods market in the world uh, by, by some distance. It still remains that. Uh, so it's hugely important to us. Uh, there, there are all sorts of reasons why it's an attractive market to, to, to approach. There's a, a reasonably common language. There's um, a, a long history, I think, of understanding of what uh, Scottish luxury textile product is about. So the Made in Scotland brand is, is hugely important, and, and that's something I'll come to uh, later on. Uh, however, there are uh, serious barriers uh, in place at the moment to... Uh, growth. And this is what we're hoping that this particular uh, agreement, when it comes, and we do hope it comes, we're very much uh, behind the, the need for uh, a transatlantic uh, trade agreement of this kind. Um, we're, lo we're looking at, in particular, uh, tariffs, as a, a, unlike the whiskey uh, trade, unfortunately tariffs really is a, a huge issue for us. Not least the, the weird and wonderful uh, sort of discrepancies that there are, and, and my colleague um, Benny Hartop will, will give some detail to that later on. Um, but, but there is a, a really confused situation where some uh, particular products attract uh, one uh, level of tariff and others attract either a much, much higher or a much, much lower level. It's, it's extremely confusing. Furthermore, it's not a level playing field because there are uh, countries out with the EU uh, who have zero tariffs on their goods going into the States. Uh, now, we are directly competing with them, but competing at very much at a, at a disadvantage. Uh, a, because they're, they're coming usually from low-cost uh, countries, uh, but also B, because the, the rate of tariff is, uh, well, is, is zero, uh, and we're paying perhaps 14% uh, or, in fact, more on, on some goods. So that's a serious issue for us. Uh, I mentioned also um, the uh, Made in Scotland uh, brand, and there's some confusion at the moment. I, I have to confess I'm not quite clear about how this is uh, developing, but there has been a suggestion that the American uh, side, if you like, in these negotiations is insisting on uh, a definition in terms of uh, a country of origin label. So a Made in Scotland label, let's say, they're insisting that I think it's three processes um, at least three processes uh, be processes that have been carried out in that country. Now that may in the face of it sound quite sensible, but the reality is that certainly in textiles, a lot of our raw material we purchase from uh, out, with, uh, out with the UK, out with the EU in some instances. So, you know, it could be Australian wool or it could be New Zealand wool. Now, that traditionally has always been the case. We don't have the, um, the level of production in the UK of, of wool to, to meet that demand. Uh, also, other fibres like cashmere, for example, most certainly comes from out with uh, our shores because we don't have the climate, despite the weather we've got today. Uh, we don't have the extremes of climate. We, you need a very hot uh, and a very cold uh, um, uh, sort of spectrum of, of climate to, to produce cashmere. Uh, we don't have that. So we purchase our, our fibres from outside the, the, the country very often. If, in fact, the Americans are going to insist on this three processes rule, then that's going to mean that we perhaps cannot uh, put a Made in Scotland label on our product, despite the fact that the, 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 the entire process, other than the purchase of the raw material, uh, has uh, been made. Now, we're not sure about that. Uh, and if anyone is able to clarify that for us, that, that would be uh, hugely useful. Um, but there are other technical barriers, and uh, they've been alluded to already by Alan, and I think uh, these are serious matters, actually, for the industry. It adds a huge amount of cost when you have to employ a broker uh, to ensure that your goods are uh, taken through customs in, in the United States. That can cost something like 20%. Uh, on to or add something like 20% on to the cost of your, your product. Now, why does that come about? Because it, actually the United States seems to us from outside to be an incredibly bureaucratic um, country in many ways. And certainly when it comes to customs regulations, that's most certainly the case. Um, so uh, getting our goods into the States can be a headache. Uh, there are other issues, and, and again Alan has alluded to this, on uh, testing standards, uh, which in textiles are extremely important. 
Uh, and, and that can be, again, it can be very confusing, it can be very costly, and it's actually duplicating what, what is going on elsewhere. So that, that's uh, a serious issue. Manufacturing and identification codes is another one. They have one system, we have another system in Europe. We need some degree of harmonization there so we know that we're talking about the same sort of thing. These are key barriers, um, technical barriers if you like, but, but barriers nonetheless. But finally, what I would say uh, is that uh, as far as we're concerned, uh, we have the product, we most certainly have the product, we've got the service to go along, along with that product. The United States presents a fantastic opportunity for us. Uh, we can grow business there, but we do need to have a level playing field. We shouldn't be competing against low-cost countries uh, who are being favoured by, um, well, by very favourable tariff rates, and that, that's not, not, not helping us at all. Um, and we need to have these, these other technical barriers uh, removed or at, the, or at the very least harmonised. Uh, so uh, overall that's, that's our position. Okay, thank you very much. I've got Benny and then John. Benny. Yes, yeah, so again, uh, maybe just some context on uh, my business. We are uh, a big employer in the, the border area, employing over 200 people, and the textile trade is a still a very important part, both of the Scottish industry and uh, the local borders economy as well. We currently export about 30% of our turnover to the USA, and that is by far and away the largest market uh, for us. It's mainly cashmere that we sell into the States at the moment, and this attracts a 4% duty tariff. Now, 4% is bad enough on a high-value product. It adds a considerable price uh, for the end customer and certainly detracts from the volumes that potentially we could sell. However, if you compare that to the woolen spun tariffs, which attract a 16% duty rate, it just, just kills any opportunity stone dead. I mean, this is a real barrier to entry, and I mean, we just have to get a level playing field. I mean, I had uh, the sourcing director of Brooks Brothers in my factory last week, and they buy uh, a large uh, part of uh, their cashmere business from us at the moment. They are keen to expand that into woolen spun products, but he is as well aware of me about the problems with 16% import duties, and I mean, he's looking at options to perhaps knit it in Scotland and then get it finished in Mauritius, which is one of the duty-free countries that David <coughs> mentioned, which just lowers the, the cost of importing it into the States. And we're just holding back development and potential growth and jobs in the local economy. We just absolutely have to find some way <coughs> to get a, local, uh, a level playing field. Thank you. John? Yeah, just to, thanks, convener, to build on the points made, I think you're hearing that you know, the US... Um, is a, is a huge market um, for Scottish exports. It's our biggest market, accounting for 13% of our exports. Um, it's also the biggest investor in Scotland. Around 40% of investment in Scotland across the sectors is made by the US. So already it's you know, an incredibly important uh, trading partner. Uh, and we believe that TTIP could, um, across the various sectors, you know, really um, help contribute to the Scottish Government's objective of increasing economic growth and that through international competitiveness. We absolutely have to increase the international <coughs> competitiveness of Scottish companies and Scottish sectors uh, in order to achieve that, 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 that growth objective. So it would be really interesting to see how TTIP plays out in terms of the opportunities and challenges and implications across Scotland's sectors. Um, Scott, I think maybe you're, you're, if we can get some comments from you, and then I'm, I'm, I think Adam Ingram would like to pick up some of the points on the US market. Yeah, Scott. Yeah, I just think on, um, from the life sciences point of view, and just a, a brief background to, to some of you who, who uh, get confused with the term life sciences as uh, uh, I do. Uh, life sciences spans from uh, everything from uh, making penicillin in Scotland to uh, uh, touch bionics, the bionic hand, to digital health, so ICT applications. So it's very broad. In Scotland, it means about three billion of turnover to our companies, and uh, it's been something that's um, growing. Um, and from 2009 to 2012, it grew in employment terms 15%. So it's something that we're we're really keen on in Scotland, and we're we're very good at it. And, and one of the things that we are very good at is is the regulatory affairs part of it because quality is uh, it's in our genes in Scotland and it's something that we, we promote and indeed a lot of the 
US companies that are here are, are here to have a footprint in Europe and in Scotland uh, because of our ability to, um, to regulate um, and to have products that uh, genuinely will not cause harm to patients and uh, I think that's something to be proud of. So I think a lot of the regulatory issues that are discussed under TTIP are, are um, very important to us. Um, we regulate here in Europe, uh, we have standards and if we want to go to the US we have a similar but different set of standards that we have to regulate to which to be honest is a bit of a pain but uh, we've just been getting on with it for years. Um, some of it is uh, for investors, um, if you go down one regulatory path, a lot of investors will say, well, I'm not, I'm not interested in investing. If it's, a, if, if it's the, um, the more friendly 510k equivalence type regulatory path, then investors are, are more interested in that. But primarily investors are investing and they're asking you how much of the US market are you going to get with this? And the world's a big place. We've got companies that don't deal with the US because of regulation, um, and they're doing very well. Uh, but at the end of the day, the US is our, is our big, big goal for us, and uh, we, we, we work very well with them. And I just see TTIP as a, a potential um, uh, step forward in terms of harmonization of the regulation. Um, a lot of US companies are actually see the European regulation as um, a, a less onerous uh, regulation and uh, indeed will try to have their products regulated in the US before they then go back uh, to Europe, before they then go back to their home market and then regulate in, in, um, in uh, the US. So I think there's an advantage. I think Europe's slightly ahead of the game in regulation, and uh, I think we can build on that through TTIP to try and get some harmonisation. Thanks very much. Scott Adam. Yeah, well, thank, thanks very much for that uh, evidence, uh, gentlemen. Um, we're kind of genetically programmed to believe that free trade is a good thing and uh, it uh, helps to create jobs and the like. However, I did... Um, see uh, some negative um, comment on the NAFTA agreement um, uh, from the United States. The United States were sold uh, the agreement on the basis that it would mean significant increase in jobs and economic activity for the American economy and the opposite appears to have happened. And what you've told us this morning is basically you've laid out some of the opportunities that would be available in the American market for Scottish goods like um, uh, luxury textiles or life sciences. Uh, but surely there's another side to the coin in terms of uh, the impact of uh, American uh, or North American uh, um, exports into uh, Scotland and the UK. So uh, one of the things that perhaps I'd like to ask John Crawford is what work has been done in terms of the net impact on jobs of if TTIP came to be. Um, the net impact of jobs in Scotland, which is really what we are interested in. So I've heard one side of the, the argument from you. I'd like to hear a bit more in terms of the threats um, posed by such an agreement. Um, John, do you want to answer that question directly? Then I'll, I'll bring you another one. John. Okay. Um, thanks very much for the question. And yes, obviously there are going to be implications on both sides for the sectors and companies. So opportunities trading out and investing in, but also, you know, there could well be, yeah. you know, implications in terms of more competitiveness for Scottish products and companies um, as our market is opened up to US products and services. In terms of the net impact on jobs, um, Scottish Enterprise or Hans Lars Enterprise hasn't done any analysis of that at the minute, so that could well be something that you know, we would like to, to undertake as you know, uh, DTIP plays out. So we haven't done that analysis yet. Okay, Alan, do you want to come? I guess of the answer to that is whether the glass is half full or half empty. Um, and in my case, it's always half full. Um, the opportunities are there. 
as Benny is saying, um, for him to try and grow his business. And there are thousands of companies like Benny's who are trying to create new, new export markets and create jobs by export of the US. There's already 2 million jobs that coexist between the US and the UK. And there are hundreds of big US companies located, for example, Morgan Stanley in Glasgow that does lots of um, the back office stuff and financial services, and many other US companies who come here. So we could sit back and worry about it, but let's be positive and look forward to treat the opportunities. And I accept it's not a zero-sum game, that there will be some jobs that will be created in the US to sell into Scotland, but let's try and do more to sell into there. I would be a bit more comfortable if I wasn't depending on blind faith. As uh, but, but with due respect, John Mark, you're, you're, um, there, are, there have been many other trade agreements across the world. David mentioned the Canadian European trade agreement that comes into place uh, next month. Um, and we'll see opportunities that arise from there. So it's not an unusual step for nations to reach trade agreements or trading blocks to do so. And free trade has for centuries proven, and Glasgow was built upon free trade. Mm -hmm. uh, tobacco Lords and all the others, so it's not something that Scotland uh, hasn't done in the past. We did have such a thing as imperial preference, of course, which maybe had some, something to do with uh, yeah, not, the growth of I, I wasn't suggesting a turn to that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I believe the workforce didn't have very many yeah. rights either, no. um, but that's another story yeah. for another day. David? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Just a couple of points to pick up on there, if I may. I think from a, a Scotch whisky industry perspective, I mean, trade liberalisation the reduction of tariffs, uh, easier operating environment has been fundamental to the industry's success over the last 30 to 40 years. I mean, we've, there's been at a WTO level uh, and GATT uh, a number of deals since the Second World War and the industry has consistently uh, benefited as a result in terms of being able to grow its exports. I mean, to, to give you some examples, it's only through those trade disciplines being in place that we've been able to get fairer access to uh, markets like Japan to markets in South America, um, some of the trade deals that I was alluding to earlier have been, have been, have been beneficial to us. Um, I take the point though, and I think it's important to stress when you're looking at this in, in the widest perspective, um, we have to understand what that picture is. And at the same time as the EU and the US are looking at a trade deal, uh, the US is facing in the opposite direction and looking to negotiate a trade deal with its partners around the Pacific Rim the, to throw in some more letters uh, at the same time as T TTIP, we've got TPP being negotiated. Uh, now, those are with uh, countries with a lower cost environment than we have here in Europe. In, in my sector, if you look at the, the countries involved in that negotiation, you've got the likes of Chile, Japan, Mexico, Peru, all of whom produce high quality spirits. We have to be alert to that. And that's why uh, making sure that we have the best arrangements in place with the United States uh, to promote that uh, trade uh, is important because if we don't, you know, there's one example, uh, there's already an agreement that is just as far advanced in terms of negotiation, probably even further advanced, um, that will change the dynamic in terms of trade relations with the United States. So we need to be alert to that. I think there was just like, one other thing I wanted to, to pick up on, if, if I may, just from earlier remarks from, uh, from David, uh, which were, were very interesting. The, the technical side of things, the, the rules of origin, uh, arrangements are uh, notoriously difficult and the negotiation is still at a very early stage in that respect. So I think there's, there's still all to, to play for there, David. Um, from a spirits industry perspective, we try to be proactive in, in this sort of area. So we've been working with the United States spirits industry um, and through them the USTR, ourselves with the European Commission and other European spirits partners to get ahead of the game and put up a potential spirits annex to this agreement, which tries to take head on potential issues and put in place the sort of standards that we believe would be appropriate right across the, the US and the EU for our sector. Now that would have a benefit in terms of uh, our industry's exports to the US, but also as I said right at the start of my own remarks, it sets a benchmark that other trade agreements then have to reach. Uh, the TPP countries are trying to do exactly the same thing. So we, we have to stay ahead of the game here, be proactive, and that's where you can gain the advantages of the agreement. Thank you. Adam, do you want to come, wish to come back on um, that? Well, as I say, I think uh, we're perhaps represented here by sectors who would obviously benefit significantly from an easing of trade barriers with the United States or regulations uh, and the like. Um, but there may be other industries which uh, might suffer. I'm thinking perhaps of the food in industry in particular where 
um, American um, imports might have a significant impact uh, uh, here. And I'm astonished actually we don't actually have a hard and fast figures in terms of estimates of, of the impact on jobs or on, on our own indigenous companies of, of this agreement. Impact assessment until we know what the outcome is. I mean, um, if, 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 as we hope, it's a fulsome agreement that, that, that tackles, reduces tariffs and reduces regulations, the impact could be huge. If it's less ambitious and less successful, the impact will be less. So until that outcome is known, the figures themselves could be open to uh, severe, severe scrutiny. The, the figures that have been produced are based on a, a middle ranking um, result, but if we push for a, a higher standard, then the results could be a lot bigger. But I don't think it's, I think it's unfair to expect to have figures on something which haven't yet uh, reached agreement on. If, if I may, in terms of the food and drink sector, Adam, there actually hasn't been a round of negotiations yet on food and drink issues. We've, we've had seven rounds of negotiation. Uh, the expectation is that the first discussion uh, will take place in February next year. So there's still, as I say, there's all to play for here mm -hmm. uh, by making sure that uh, Scottish interests are as well represented in the Commission's negotiating positions as possible. Okay. The other aspect of, uh, of this, is, of course, is the level of investment in Scotland from, from U.S. companies. And uh, uh, one of the reasons that we seem to attract a, attract a fair bit of investment from the US was for those companies to enter the European market, as it were, to have a base within the EU. Now, if we're going to liberalise um, trade and investment between the US and the EU, <coughs> is there not a threat of disinvestment in Scotland as a consequence of that? Because uh, people can... I suggest it's the opposite. Okay. There's even more reason to be based over here because the opportunities for them will be bigger. And one of the reasons they come to Scotland, or many reasons, but we have a highly educated workforce. Our costs are lower than many other um, locations across Europe, and, and we have a ready supply of labour, and we have good um, contacts with the continental Europe. So the, the reasons why they could, come, we could, could become more, as long as we avoid increasing costs on business, which some, some people wish to do, then, they, then trying to attract them to Scotland could prove more difficult. Right. Yeah, just to build on that, as I said earlier, 40% of Scottish investment comes from um, the US, and that's compared to an overall UK figure of 26%. So it just shows the attractiveness of Scotland um, uh, uh, as, a, as an investment location um, for US companies. And just to also that um, that investment, 40% of Scottish research, research and development expenditure, you know, comes from these US companies. So it's incredibly important when the US companies come in here, and they're creating jobs. Um, I know that Scottish Development International um, have helped to secure over 13,500 jobs from US companies um, over the last five years. We've also got uh, major employers such as Amazon that employ 3,000 across four, four sites in Scotland. We've got Morgan Stanley, as I alluded to earlier, employing 1,200 in Glasgow and Hewlett Packard. 1400 in Erskine. So, US investment is incredibly important at the minute. I think there's a strong connection. Scotland is incredibly attractive as a place to invest, particularly for US companies. So, you know, building, if, if, if there are things that could enable that, make it easier, then, you know, surely it's got to be a good thing. Sometimes American businesses are portrayed as being uncaring large multinationals that are just over here to kind of take advantage of us and they head, head back home. Memex, which was based in East Kilbride, a software security company, founded, I think, 10, 15 years ago, grew to a level where it became attractive for purchase from a US company, and it's now, it was bought over by SAS, and the number of employees has increased, and it's now reaching markets it never used to before, which is another example of where, where it's a cooperation, as long as we've got the skills, then the US will come here and create jobs and opportunities for our people, which I hope is what we're all about. Okay, Scott. Yeah. Well, I think your concerns are valid, to be honest. Um, but at, at the moment, for us, um, uh, we take a, a sledgehammer to crack the nut to get into uh, America, and we'll set up operations in the U.S. just to get a, a, a head start into their regulatory process. So, if there was a harmonisation, we could um, um, get round not having to set up those operations. The the barrier that 
the US companies have, or the reason that they wouldn't stop investing in Scotland is it's the people, it's the quality, it's that regulatory framework. And we've tried um, through uh, um, uh, outsourcing uh, our manufacturing um, to places like India or, or even to the US. And I think uh, if I look at the US and the NAFTA uh, agreement and what happened in the automotive industry where they tried to uh, outsource a lot of their um, uh, quality uh, automotive, job, automotive jobs to, to Mexico. And in fact, Mexico had a better quality standard at the end of it. And that's why they've kept the manufacturing there. And I think that's the same parallel we can have in Scotland is that we could have an agreement like NAFTA for all the flaws, but at the end of the day, the American companies would want to be here, global companies would want to be here, and we have global companies trying to locate in Scotland. One of the issues we have in Scotland that I think is a, is a detractor is we don't have a notified body to regulate um, companies in Scotland. It's something as the Life Sciences Association we're looking to, to do, and if we had that, then that would be another incentive for, for companies from all over the world to come to Scotland to manufacture um, well-regulated, high-quality products, which then you could um, 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 send throughout the world. The, the, the outsourcing that um, GSK have done in, in India, for example, they've, they've brought it all back into Scotland, and we're seeing the plants for GSK up in Montrose and uh, down in Irvine as uh, you know, their increasing footprint at the moment. So, so we've kind of been down that route. Yeah. And, you know, it's coming back because of the, the, the good people. And, you know, back to the research and development, I think uh, a lot of the money that's going into research and development goes into our universities. But I think the important thing for me, for the universities, is that we are um, uh, uh, training and upskilling graduates that can come out that have uh, uh, an expertise in the quality and the regulatory framework. We've been working with uh, universities like Edinburgh Napier and Glasgow Caledonian to make sure that the graduates coming out have that quality, have that regulatory skill, that you have a source of those people in Scotland. So we're working very um, uh, fleet of foot at the moment to make sure that we've got the things that the American companies just don't really get to grips with on quality that we can in Scotland. Okay, Rod Campbell next. Vina, I'd just like to follow up some of the themes that my colleague Adams already alluded to, uh, and particularly to pick up some points which were made in evidence in a previous uh, session by Stephen Boyd of the STUC, um, which I took to, to mean that, that it, it wasn't uh, rejecting uh, the possibility of for want of a better word, there being a good TTIP, but just that the information and evidence wasn't currently there. Um, it, I think it's also been accepted in evidence uh, uh, before a select committee in the House of Commons in London that the CBI hadn't done an economic analysis of the impact on different sectors. And Mr. Boyd, when he gave evidence, said that even if the model that the Commission was using was correct, it would imply an annual increment in GDP of about 0.03% and that the models being used to promote TTIP's benefit explicitly do not include those areas in which it could have a detrimental effect on growth and jobs. You mentioned uh, patents and the cost of drugs. Very important to remember that TTIP is not a free trade agreement, it's, a common, it's about common regulatory structures. Big pharmaceutical industries will seek to ensure that their patents are stronger, longer and more far-reaching. I think we know enough about the dissemination of knowledge on economics to know that that will have a negative effect on the wider economy over a longer period and the models used just do not consider such issues. I'd like to put that out for general comment and discussion. Do you want to come back to that, Scott? I was thinking of giving it. Um, so, uh, I mean, the patenting issue, I don't think patents uh, uh, are part of the TTIP agreement. Um, it's certainly something that uh, uh, we've dealt with separately and we now have a European wide patent that, that's incredibly helpful to us. I think on the, on the US side it's still, <coughs> you're not um, likely to get the same level of cover in, your, in the US that you will in Europe. But I think that's a separate issue. The fact that um, the pharmaceutical companies are looking for increased cover um, on their patents is, is 
um, uh, crudely to, to cover the cost of developing these new drugs. Um, uh, I think uh, going back to the cost of developing penicillin versus the cost of uh, developing some of the newer drugs, um, it, it's now into uh, uh, billions of dollars. I think if you look at Sanofi Aventus's last drug, uh, if you look at how much it really cost them, I think it's probably up in the sort of 11.8 billion. Uh, for them to develop these new drugs, uh, there has to be some kind of an, an incentive that they, they, they will get a return on that. So I, I, I kind of get that. I think for, for any new, looking at some of our smaller drug development companies, um, trying to bring products to market, um, uh, you're, you're really looking at um, uh, working hard to get that, that patent cover. Um, I, I, I don't see the other side of that coin being of greater economic benefit than having um, uh, our drugs manufactured. Um, in Scotland. Is there not a general comment really about that we're getting kind of one side of the coin, the opportunity side of the coin, mm -hmm. and we're not, we're not also looking at the other side of the coin and, and I, no work? The last session was 100% uh, on the other side of the coin, or the last session of the evidence that you took. Yes, but yeah, okay, but we, what we're trying to get at is what analysis is being undertaken across the piece, as it were, yeah. about you know, what the impact might be. Um, sure. Both you're presenting a pro side of the coin, uh, but I don't really get any impression that you've looked at, uh, in a big way at the negatives. Well, I think, I think, I think we have. Um, I think the reality of... Um, well, where's the evidence with, that you could share with the committee? Well, the evidence, on, I'll, I'll give you some statistics if that's helpful. If the regulations are removed, which is the hope, from the uh, outcome of successful TTIP, then the saving in cost to businesses such as Benny's and the other trade bodies representatives could be $8 billion, which is a lot of money that could be saved, which is currently spent by, by UK and Scottish businesses. Um, you've got tariffs, which David referred to earlier. You've got tariffs, bizarrely, on synthetic women's coats at 32 per cent, at slippers at 26 per cent. So if you're a Scottish slipper maker, if there are any, then the, the savings of 26 per cent could be huge to their business. You've got Benny at 16% who may have to face the ludicrous position of yeah. setting up an outsourcing uh, arm in Mauritius, which I wouldn't mind applying for the job helping him there. But, um, so the evidence is all around you of how the benefits could arise well, from a, what, a free trade agreement. What about analysis of the losers? The, but, well, the, the losers, but um, let's, let's look. But I, would, I would hope, uh, Mr Campbell, that we'd rather look at who could be the winners are going to be and the jobs in your constituencies and the other MSPs around this table. The harsh reality of trade is for every... Um, company who sells something someone else doesn't, but let's try and be in a position where it's our companies that are making the sales. I, th I think it's a... Yeah. Sorry. David. <laughs> I beg your pardon. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, I think it's a trade body uh, representing the, the Textile and Leather Association. Basically, we can only look at it from, from the point of view what what... what benefits would accrue to our members and that's the approach that we've taken today we've come along today to try to express uh, our frustration actually at the uh, the barriers there are to growth in terms of our business with the United States and those are quite clear uh, Benny has articulated that perfectly well I think in, in, in very real terms his business uh, with a particular customer who incidentally is one of the biggest customers in the United States for Scottish products, Brooks Brothers, um, that could grow significantly if that particular barrier were to be removed or at least if he, his business was on a level playing field with, uh, with other uh, regions out with the, uh, or the producers out with the EU. So we can only look at it from, from that perspective and from that perspective it's, it's, it's all a win. Now, I understand completely, and one thing that hasn't been mentioned here, I mean, I read the newspapers uh, as uh, anyone else does, and I'm well aware of the, the problems uh, in this regard with uh, transparency, the problems about American corporations dictating to um, governments uh, basically what their economic policy would, would be, as it seems to me. But I can't come here and, and comment on that. That's not for me. That's for economists, it's for politicians, it's uh, perhaps a Scottish enterprise actually to be looking at this kind of thing. But I represent uh, the textile industry in Scotland. I know that if we, if at least as part of this agreement we get that playing field levelled, 
then we will benefit as an industry very, very significantly. Now, that may be a relatively small part of this agreement, but for us, it's an extremely important one. And that's, that's what we're saying. Understand that. David. Thank you. I mean, just a couple of things there. I agree with uh, what David's just said about, um, you know, I represent the Scotch Whiskey Association. I can give you a Scotch Whiskey Association perspective of what this agreement would mean uh, for my industry. Um, I said right at the start, I mean, it's an unusual uh, negotiation for the whisky industry in that our usual big ticket items are not on the table. We already have a zero tariff, for example. That doesn't mean there's not a, a potential opportunity there. If you removed the remaining customs border fees that are applicable to our industry, uh, our assessment is that that saves the industry about four million pounds a year you know, from a couple of border fees. So there, you know, there's some work done there uh, regardless. Um, I would also just want to stress though, it's, it's easy just to focus on this one agreement, but I think it's important that uh, politicians look at that wider picture because if you get it right in this uh, agreement, this has a, a very significant knock-on impact to other very commercially significant agreements that the industry is looking at. So India, if you get it right in the US, the, the Indian market, it's a 150% tariff we face going into that market. It's a huge potential opportunity for the whiskey industry. You could grow that market from 1% market share to 5% market share in relatively short order if you got the, the agreement right and this sets the right sort of benchmark. So we need to take that wider perspective. I think on the transparency side, um, our experience has been that there is um, no lack of willingness on the part of the European Commission no lack of willingness on the part of the USTR, no lack of willingness on the part of the UK government to talk to stakeholders, to take on board their priorities and to share information. I mean, we know the, the lead negotiator, uh, Mr. Barcero, very well. He, he understands the industry's perspective. He's willing to talk to industry. Uh, sometimes, though, you have to go and ask uh, to make sure that they understand uh, where you're coming from. So uh, I think uh, from our perspective, uh, we've been pleased with the, the opportunities we've had uh, through a number of different avenues. We're not shy about going and asking uh, as an industry, and that's important. You can't always expect people to come to you to, to hear your views. Um, and so, you know, you have to take that opportunity. I think the other thing is, I mean, there's, there's undoubtedly a recognition on the part of the Commission that more needs to be done uh, to make the negotiation as transparent as possible whilst acknowledging this is a negotiation and you don't show all your cards during a negotiation. So Commissioner Malmström, uh, since she came into office, has been absolutely clear that uh, she wants to make uh, negotiating texts available as, as and when is possible and where it doesn't compromise the opportunity for the EU to get the best deal possible for jobs and growth right across the, the member states. Yeah, we have we've invited the, uh, Lord Livingston, we've invited the Commission and the Scottish Government as well for a future. Um, so we're, we're taking a very, very, very broad view on this. I've got, Hans Alla, I've got everyone who's indicated to me that they want to come in and I'm going to just take them in turn so that everybody gets their shot. I've got Hans Alla next. So Thank you. Um, don't fear, you're all getting in, don't worry. Uh, good morning and welcome, gentlemen, to the uh, committee this morning. Um, I wanted to ask David in particular about uh, the, the code barring you, you, you refer to in terms of your products and uh, in terms of our codes are different from their codes. Could we not double code our products so that you don't have that problem? Uh, yes, I, I guess we could, but uh, you know, why would we want to add more, um, more hassle, basically? Yeah, you know, I, think, I think the important thing here is harmonization, and I think that's uh, yeah, what we're Yeah, but remember, um, I mean, we're, we're, we're dealing with a, a, a far bigger partner than we are, and mm. their, their expectations from us are higher. Yeah. And I'm, I don't, I mean, at the end of the day, it's who dares wins and who, who goes the extra mile wins the, the charity. And I think it, in terms of products, I mean, I don't think it's such a huge deal that, you know, to, to have a double coding is going to put you out that much. I just, I just, I just wanted to j just bring that to your attention. Maybe a small consideration might be helpful in that uh, aspect. And the other aspect I wanted to talk, the other point I wanted to bring on board was about um, uh, no direct imports in certain products in terms of uh, taxation and uh, um, and one of the things that uh, was mentioned about that you have to send your products elsewhere before you can take them straight to the U.S. Um, and I'm just wondering whether uh, we can actually negotiate uh, something quite special for Scotland, uh, 
a very small trading um, post. Uh, I think that uh, if we can um, possibly have our uh, cabinet secretary to have a stab at negotiating uh, um, a tax-free zone for Scotland on its own right, uh, I know that there would be complications in terms of you know, what is actually produced in Scotland and then sent to the U.S. And we, we, we could have various, they could have various conditions attached, for example, having at least three, um, three forms of uh, work on a product before it, it would be considered Scottish uh, for that um, free zone. Um, what's, what's the opinion around the table about should we have a stab at something like that? that I mean, we don't want to send products to other countries, nor do we need to. It's simply to reduce the import tariffs yes. into the States. I mean, it was a request from uh, one of our customers to look into this. It's, it's not something that we are particularly interested in, but it's to reduce their costs of uh, buying the product effectively from us. So if, if, we, if our politicians tried to negotiate something for our industry, that is, you know, Scottish firms are, 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 are manufacturing something or treating something, uh, ma making the product in Scotland, so in, in essence it becomes a Scottish product. Just because a raw material came from elsewhere doesn't mean that all the processes were done elsewhere. If we could satisfy our customers that we are making this product for you to a certain standard, um, would it be considered as a free import? Would that be something worth pursuing? I mean, I don't want to ask our cabinet secretary to pursue something if you, the experts and the, and the sellers, won't find it helpful. But if you think that that, that would, if there's a mileage in that, we could try and pursue that. <clears throat> As I said uh, earlier, actually, we're, we're unclear at the moment quite what is happening here in terms of the, this, I, I alluded to a three processes rule, which you, you've mentioned. The, the, this is something we've become aware of only in the last day or so, and we're not clear about whether this is in fact a, a part of the US negotiating position or, or quite what it is. It's the first we've heard of it, but it certainly is of concern to us because it means that uh, raw material that we purchase from out with the EU uh, then doesn't become, it's, it's not one of those three processes. So it, it, it could be a problem for us, but we're, we're not clear on that. So I, I'm sorry, um, it's um, what you, you suggest could perhaps be an interesting uh, way to, to look at it. But at the moment, we're not clear enough about what the problem might be. So, uh, but it's, it's perhaps something to bear in mind. I, I share your view on um, who dares wins. I think it would be perhaps slightly ambitious for the Scottish Government to start setting up its own separate TTIP negotiation um, between Scotland and, uh, and the US. Uh, and I think our, your efforts would be better spent influencing the current negotiations rather than trying to establish a new trade agreement. Okay. David. Yeah, I, I, I certainly uh, admire the, Mr. Malik's ambition uh, in terms of uh, the, the idea, but in reality, it, it simply is not going to, to happen in this negotiation. Remember, you know, this deal will need to be ratified by 28 different member states. You know, 28, uh, 27 other countries are going to be looking at this and thinking, uh, why not us? So even in our own side, in terms of our own negotiating position as the EU, it's unrealistic. At the same time, you've got TPP partners in the Pacific Rim who would be looking at why for one particular part of the EU uh, and not for, for the countries of that negotiation. So in terms of the context, um, I don't think it would run very far. And you have to understand also... Um, the US mindset in relation to this. In terms of importing products at the moment, you have to deal with bioterrorism laws, you have to deal with food modernization legislation, you've still got 50 different US states uh, to deal with as well at a, at a sub-federal level. So when you put all that together, it's a very complex uh, playing field and a, a particular uh, Scottish di dimension to that in terms of some sort of uh, uh, tax-free zone would be unrealistic. I, th I think... Um if you, if you look around, there are examples where some countries in South Asia, for example, have been given preferential treatments where their products, particularly cotton, is allowed to come into the, the European market. There are examples around the world where we can piggyback on those examples to say, well, okay, um, I'm talking about something that 
by us, I totally agree with you in terms of we try to influence the current negotiation that is happening. But I think we might, we might want to look, look outside the box and say, how do we improve on that? And remember, we, we are a quite specific market. We are, we, are, we are quite a limited market, but we are a very specialist market. And I think those in, in themselves open up the idea of perhaps looking outside the box to say, how do we speak to some of our major uh, trading partners to say, listen, how about looking at us in a slightly different way uh, in, in terms of, you know, one, ensuring that we can continue to supply the quality and the, the, the specialist product that you are looking for, but also give us a, an, an opportunity to be able to do that, to compete with, you, with others, because we're not competing like for like. We have something quite unique that we are offering them, and therefore they might, I'm just say, thinking that, you know, if we go to the, the U.S. quite regularly uh, in terms of marketing Scotland and its products, uh, perhaps we should, we should be going the extra mile ourselves to say, well, okay, we've got this on the table just now, and this is what is happening, and this is what the whole crowd of us are dealing with. However, it's only, you, you're the ones who are going to tell us, well, there might be some mileage, and okay, it might not happen today, but the fact still remains that if we want to open the door, we have to start somewhere. Before, before I bring, bring you in, I've, I've got a Scott and, and David, and I think maybe the Scots Whiskey Association is uh, in the best position to you know, understand, possibly, that yeah, the Department of Trade and Industry might be very interested in Scotland going on its own on these things, given the legislation and the regulation is reserved to Westminster. So I think maybe that's something we should put in context. Scott and then David. Yeah, well, I'm happy to explore that with the Cabinet Secretary. I, I think it's challenging. Um, but, you know, wh why not? Um, we have a good relationship uh, on the medical device side, for example, with Minnesota. Minnesota is probably the world leading place for medical devices and it's, it, and it's certainly the leader in the, in the US. And we've had um, very uh, fruitful discussions uh, and, uh, over uh, the Ryder Cup, for example, and they're going to be hosting the next Ryder Cup. Uh, and we have agreed with them uh, and in fact, um, we spoke to um, uh, uh, Alec Neal at the time to see if we couldn't uh, uh, have s some kind of a delegation going over to talk to um, uh, uh, the Minnesota government and uh, industry in, in Minnesota about how we could work uh, more closely um, together. And that was welcome. So I, I think uh, we're in an even stronger position now that uh, for the next Ryder Cup, we'll have... Uh, uh, Nicola Sturgeon will actually be there because there will be a handover. So uh, there's an opportunity there. Uh, I think it's challenging in terms of where we're regulated in Europe and uh, with um, uh, biz and, and, and these issues. But uh, there, there's certainly a, a, an openness from the US side to, to have discussions on how we could work c closer together. Uh, and certainly one aspect of that is... is um, our work with the uh, with the NHS and what uh, and how we work very closely with the NHS, uh, very conscious that the NHS is a big issue for TTIP. Um, that, that same issue is not an issue for us in, in Scotland because we have a good relationship on developing products for the NHS, which will shift the balance of care, reduce costs, all those things. We are not interested in privatisation of the NHS in Scotland from an industry point of view. And indeed, we would probably support uh, uh, the Scottish Government in, in, in fighting against that as part of this agreement. Yeah, I believe Philip Hammond has said that Scotland should seek a, a, an express opt-out on its NHS services, and I think that's something that this committee and this government will probably pursue very vigorously, actually. Well, well, well it's doable, yeah. because um, we had the Nicholson Review, um, which came out with a, a set of uh, recommendations, which, um, as far as I know, um, NHS Scotland um, didn't have to actually... Um, take up and indeed um, they have, have gone down or we have gone down a, a different route uh, in Scotland under the Health Innovation Partnership um, uh, banner where industry and NHS work very closely in, um, in, in the NHS helping uh, industry develop products which are of use to them uh, and also in industry coming to the NHS saying well what are your needs what, what kind of products are you looking for and that has been something that uh, we've started uh, since the statement of intent 
and which was uh, announced by Nicola at the NHS conference in 2012. Um, that's now a position where we've got 55 companies working very closely with the NHS, developing products for the NHS, which once developed and bought by the NHS, NHS is not going to be the biggest customer by a way for us, but the fact that the NHS is buying Scottish manufactured products is a huge selling point, absolutely huge. If you, if you look at companies like um, Touch Bionics, <coughs> The bionic hand sell uh, mostly into the US, uh, but through that new partnership, they've managed to come from a position where they've never sold to the NHS in Scotland, never sold to their home market, to now selling six bionic hands. Yeah, David. Just to come back on uh, um, Hans Anna's uh, suggestion, which uh, I agree. I mean, if, we, if such a thing were possible, that, that would be great. Uh, I think it hugely unlikely, however, I share David's view on, on that. I think it would be a hugely complex thing to try and uh, achieve. Uh, what, what's much simpler, from our point of view, is to get that level playing field. And that's the really important thing uh, that, that we need, is to get the, 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 uh, our competitive position relative to uh, producers from out with the UK to get that onto a level playing field, to remove the barriers that, that are there. The, these are, uh, if you like, technical things, uh, but they should all be part and parcel of any negotiation of this kind. And, and if our negotiators, uh, our European negotiators, are strong enough in this, then I would like to think we would get the result that we need. Um, and that seems to me to be a, a, a much more obvious and, and much easier in a way. I don't think it will be easy, but uh, hopefully it, 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 it will be something that's achievable. So that, that is really the central thing that we, we wish to see. John, did you want to come back in some general comments yeah. about... Uh, just a couple of points to come back on. I mean, just to go back to the previous conversation around there are opportunities, but there are also challenges. Um, what we will be doing in the Scottish Enterprise, Scottish Government, um, Hal and Zyle's Enterprise, because there's various national bodies responsible for the economy, we will be working very hard with all the industry sectors that are implicated by this, not just the ones here today, but also energy, with oil and gas, with, with chemicals, with, um, with creative industries. So we've been working very hard with them and the national institutions to really look, you know, at, once we get into these um, particular sector agreement and uh, negotiation discussions, really look hard at, you know, what's happening, what the implications are, um, and make sure that, you know, we're playing Scotland's advantage. The other thing I'd like to say, I was speaking to a couple of MDs of companies that do trade with the States, um, and it just brought home, you know, that the, the, the scale, whilst the US is Scotland's biggest export market, and that many uh, Scottish MSC, SMEs are very keen to export there, it's a very complex, you know, market. There's over 300 million people, there's 50 states, all of their own regulatory framework. So it's a very complex market to get into if, you, if you're not aware of it. So anything that can help to you know, make that transition, make that journey into what is a complex market um, would be welcome, particularly for Scotland, um, which has a very broad uh, SME base, 300,000 SMEs, the vast majority of whom are 10 employees or less. So it's, it's really hard, really important that we work with our company base and to get into that market, and we've obviously got um, Scottish Development International out there with five offices in the United States, so you know we have the channels. But just the last point, um, speaking to an MD of a company yesterday, they were saying that you know in, in America, um, in the United States, um, they have a sort of buy America, you know, policy. Anything that can help to, to get a company to drive a USP, that unique selling point, that's the big differentiator here. Um, you know, if, if you have a, an equivalent U.S. product, trade or good or service that, that is viable, they wouldn't really look at a foreign one. But if you've got a, a product or a service that genuinely has a unique selling point, you know, that's where that real niche competitive advantage, like whiskey, like high, uh, high luxury textiles, that's you know, that's the big winner here. And just to go back to what I was saying earlier. We absolutely have to get more Scottish companies, that SME base, we have to get internationally active. We are not internationally active enough as a, as a, as a nation. We reckon we, we, need, we need around 5,000 more SMEs being internationally active just to get to UK export levels. So, you know, we've got a big task on our hands here. And if this is our biggest export market then, as, as I said earlier, something that can that can uh, you know, help enable trade investment on both sides and make that, 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 that commerce easier is 
to be welcome out of thought. Please, and one of them is health related. We've got Craneware, which is a technology company based in Edinburgh, and its sole customer base is US hospitals. So all it provides to is the US health service. And um, we've heard lots of ill-informed comments about the dangers to the NHS with TTIP, but there's a company that's actually doing business from Edinburgh into the US health service, which is worth members thinking about, and employs and creates taxes to pay for the services in Scotland. We also have Skyscanner, a travel-based technology company, started in, in Edinburgh. Small, six, six people started up next to Edinburgh University because of the excellent graduate it produces. It's now got an office in Miami and is taking on Kayak, which is another uh, travel technology business in the American's backyard. And lastly, you've got FanDuel, which is a, a gaming, um, sporting-related business based in Edinburgh, which has grown across the US. And that backs up John's point that Scottish companies have got, the, have got the USP technology to take them forward, and they need support, and TTIP can help provide it. But they also need to avoid their costs being increased. And so policymakers have to consider that as well. Just, Excuse just, me, just sorry, if, if, I'm sorry, but we've got lots of members who want, want to get in. And, and could you please let me know if you want to get in? Because um, eh, I know we want to have a bit of a free, free flow conversation, but I have got many members and, and many other people needing to get into the conversation as well. Jamie, you've been waiting a while. <laughs> oh, well, thank you. And I'm sorry I wasn't here at the start, convener. Um, just in relation to what John Crawford said, uh, the Scottish North American Business Council um, explained that it had organised two roadshows in Scotland um, and the key lesson from the roadshows uh, was the potential benefits for SMEs um, and uh, the, the message really was that the smaller you are the more the um, huge obstacles which businesses face when doing business with the US the, the smaller you are the more these obstacles get in your way now these negotiations have been going on since June 2013 and there's been seven rounds of negotiations have so far taken place and the agreement is more encompassing than a normal free trade agreement because it just, it's not just about lowering of tariffs but also about regulatory regimes. So there's an awful lot to, to be told about this. Now, we have received the committee some evidence from stakeholders that there's a lack of awareness across the Sp Scottish business community about the TTIP negotiations. And I have to say that last week I went to uh, a briefing from one of our largest banks in Scotland um, on food and drink, a, business, a breakfast me meeting. And uh, when I asked a question about TTIP, they hadn't heard of it, which I thought was rather astonishing. Um, and my question, I suppose, probably is to first of all John Crawford I suppose is to say um, you know what is the work going on to make Scottish businesses more aware of TTIP because you, you were saying yourself you needed another 5,000 SMEs to, to get involved with this is there enough you know we're halfway through the negotiations nearly now um, or possibly is enough being done here to make people aware of all of what this, this agreement actually means in terms of opportunities for, for businesses, especially. So just to, to go back to what I was saying, I think it's really important that the national agencies alongside industry channels like the Institute Directors and CBI and the Chambers of Commerce and the Business Gateways, that we, we, we collectively understand to get a better understanding across the sectors of what the implications are for our companies and really help to you know, get the message out. Um, but it, it is a challenge, but to go back, you know, most of our Scottish companies are small and medium-sized enterprises, very small ones, so we absolutely have to work the channels. Uh, and it's not just TTIP, it's, it's trying to get them much more internationally competitive, and that, that, that is about the only thing that can really improve the Scottish economy. Can I, can I just add something in, in, in that, Jamie? The Scottish Chambers of Commerce, when I, we asked them to come to committee, said they didn't think they were in a position you know, to, to have enough information to... to give to the committee so there's maybe a bit of a job of work to, to be done there and we did get some written evidence from the CBI as well. Jamie, sorry. Can, I, can I just ask something? Oh, can I go on? Of course you can. Yeah. Um, well, uh, independent studies um, have projected that the EU exports to the US would increase by 28% each year as a result of, of a good TTIP agreement. Um, and it also just predicts that 
the UK economy would given a, be given a boost of 10 billion each year, and I think Scotland was something like 1.7 billion. Um, why would it, surely, if, if, the, if the independent studies have projected that EU exports um, would increase by 28%, why would the UK only, get, only benefit by 10 billion? And surely this would be an, an increasing figure, would it not? It's very, it's very hard. The point I made earlier in the evidence, it's very hard to give precise figures, but the harsh reality is if, if, if you saw an increase in exports of that level, then the benefits to the UK and Scotland would be very significant. Uh, be as far as I'll go. Jimmy? I don't have anything else at the moment. Okay, I've got Willie Coffee. <laughs> <laughs> Can I just, one last point? Very quickly, Jimmy. Uh, we, we talked about businesses. Um, I would just like to discuss with, with witnesses the possible benefits to consumers in Scotland uh, from a good TTIP agreement. Alan? Uh, benefits to consumers would be they could hopefully be when the uh, retail sector which is thriving at the moment the, the, the costs of American goods coming into the UK would, could be cheaper uh, and also the, those who go on holiday to the States could buy um, Benny's jumpers at a much more reasonable price than they can currently and other goods over in Scotland. Okay, okay Jimmy. Yeah, Willie Coffee. Much convenient. Good morning to the panel. Um, I mean, there, there, there have been some precise figures shared with us around the table already. Alan, you mentioned a potential saving of eight billion, uh, and both David and Benny have mentioned some of these percentage duties and so on, as high as 16% and higher. So, uh, if, if these savings are realised, I'm absolutely certain that that's welcome to be welcomed. Uh, but there is a quid pro quo with TTIP, isn't there? What is, what is America getting out of this? Presumably. They are also looking forward to harmonisation of regulation and reducing tariffs to perhaps zero. And I suppose my question from a naive point of view is, why has it not been possible up until now without this thing called TTIP being invented? If that was always possible to do, what were we waiting for so long to, to try to, to achieve that? Um, and isn't a concern that was expressed at one of our previous sessions that what's happening on the back of TTIP is providing guaranteed and legal access, access to our services, products and services within the European Union. And that's where some of the concerns are coming from that have been shared with the committee previously. So, A, what's America getting out of this that they couldn't already have gotten out of this beforehand without a TTIP? And are, are the fears genuine about giving legal access to services within the Union that hitherto may not have been available? Um, what's America getting out of it? The opportunity to sell their goods more easily into the US and for their companies that are many of them, as I've mentioned earlier, are already based here, which we shouldn't forget that the companies that are based here are more likely to remain here and companies such as SAS who have purchased a Scottish company and grown it, companies such as Morgan Stanley, HP and others who are based here are more likely to remain here. But the, the harsh reality as we saw in the 80s, some companies invest in Scotland and then when the climate changes they leave. And if these changes are brought in, that's less likely to happen, uh, which is good news for your constituents and uh, the Scottish economy. And it frees up trade both ways so that Scottish businesses can sell to the US. But what's in it for the US is a greater access to the European market. And, but then the, that creates supply chain jobs for the, for the businesses that they are looking to invest in and create opportunities for employment and growth. But is that all coming about through TTIP? I mean, harmonising regulations and reducing tariffs was always on the agenda. But the harsh, no. the harsh, the harsh reality... But now it is, though. That's, that's my yeah. point. It is Just now. So what is, what is the I, gain I, or the big win for, for example, the US to but, agree a TTIP arrangement with the European Union? Because it's very difficult to achieve those, those, those harmonies without having some kind of trade agreement running alongside it. It's not as easy as that, as that sounds. Many trees have died in the, in the, in the cause of um, trade agreements over, the, over, over decades and it's not as easy to achieve as, it, as, that, as that sounds. And the last point about the legal challenges, um, since 75, the UK has negotiated 94 bilateral treaties, almost all of which included ISDS provisions and it's important to note that UK investors have brought at least 43 ISDS claims to protect their investments <coughs> and no, no ISDS challenge has ever succeeded against the UK. So whilst at the last meeting ISDS was raised some great bogey that would allow businesses to, or sorry, allow governments, sorry, allow businesses to attack democratic governments. The harsh reality is ISDS 
It's the reverse we're used for. It's for business people like Benny and others who face hardship from governments. They're there, to, they're there to, to protect them, which is sometimes forgotten in the argument put forward by those who are opposed to it. Uh, David, I think you'd come in because you battled with tariffs, your industry's battled with tariffs for years and maybe give you a bit of an insight into what's happened yeah. so far. Yeah, I've, I've lived this for a long time, Mr Coffey, so it's, uh, <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a really interesting question. I think you have to think back and look at the context. Why has this not happened before? It's not happened in recent years because, because of an economic recession and during that time people become more protectionist uh, in terms of uh, their own industries rather than looking outward and looking for trade liberalisation. Um, things like beef hormones, Airbus and Boeing have been huge trade disputes between the EU and the US and there was no way of starting this sort of negotiation until those sort of issues had been resolved or at least parked in, in some sort of way. So the context has, has gradually changed and that's why there was an opportunity uh, to do something uh, at, at this stage. The regulatory approaches side of things it doesn't make headlines but the difference in regulatory approaches between the EU and the US shouldn't be underestimated um, and getting different regulators round the table to look at this sort of issue is a, is a long term uh, piece of work. People are protective of their, of their own patches and their own approach and that's why from a, from a whisky industry perspective we've tried to look at this slightly differently by putting up a joint proposal with our American colleagues from the American spirits industry who've already spoken to their own regulators about it as we've spoken to, to the Commission um, on our side to try and cut a way through it because it is very difficult. Even in a, in a, a category like whiskey or the, the wider spirits industry there are, there are different interpretations, different approaches and so regulatory coherence is something that is a, is a prize whilst it may not uh, gain many headlines the day after a TTIP negotiation is concluded. Is, is, is guaranteed access to our markets and services then not a concern that you, you share? I think for, from the, the US side, which I can only speak from a spirits industry perspective, this is not going to dramatically increase uh, their access to the European market in the same way that when I started, I'm not suggesting this is going to have a dramatic increase in terms of Scotch whisky exports to the US. It's, it's that bigger picture for us. Um, from the US side, they are looking at... Um, to make it easier around labelling, certification and testing in different member states, not suggesting this is a UK issue but in different member states in the same way that uh, we would like to see a, a more harmonised approach in those sort of areas across different US states as well as at the federal level. Okay, Scott. I think um, on, the, on the regulatory side, uh, I guess the concern was maybe a, it's a race to the bottom in terms of uh, lowering the standards and, and the US could potentially uh, move us to uh, uh, a less regulated, less quality type framework. Uh, I'm pretty sure that's not going to happen. Uh, I think uh, regulation change is a difficult thing uh, for us at any stage uh, and we're going through some uh, major regulatory uplifts at the moment in both the uh, uh, material, uh, medical devices uh, uh, regulation and also in the uh, in vitro diagnostics uh, regulation and um, that has primarily come about because of the PIP scandal on the, on the implants. So it's unlikely that uh, the European uh, Union are, are, are going to lower those, those hurdles. So if anything, the US are going to have to raise their game if they want to deal in Scotland. Um, do they have the ability to do that? It's, having lived in the US, it's going to be a tough one for them. It would be much easier for them to get a footprint into, the, into Europe to, to start manufacturing their products to that higher regulation. Uh, so that's, that's the potential downside for the US and maybe why they might not be that interested, but they won't be able to sell their products into Europe unless they comply with these new regulations anyway. Um, access to public services. Um, I, you know, I think... Uh, we, we all know it's very difficult to access the NHS, uh, be it a US company or, or be it a, a, a local company. I don't think that's going to stop. And uh, I think uh, having worked with the NHS now for, for several years, uh, again, it's, you're not going to be able to sell in unless you've got the highest possible regulatory standards. So I think, again, we're, that's, it's going to be something that will, uh, will, will be of benefit to us the US might just walk away from the table and just say, well, we'll just keep doing what we're doing. If, if we push on that one, I think that would be fine, but you might lose out in some of the, the tariffs. 
Are you quite clearly saying then, because some of the concerns that's been raised with this committee is that there would be a race to the bottom on regulation, it would be the lowest of standards rather than the highest of standards. Are you saying that the opposite of that is true? It would be the highest. Right. Uh, okay. uh, as an industry, we're not going to lower our regulatory issues. Uh, and, and I think in the US, uh, being a, a highly lit litigious uh, environment, it would be very difficult for a hospital to take a product of lower standard. If something goes wrong, uh, they will get sued okay. if there's a higher regulatory product out there. And that's, that's a benefit and an opportunity for Scottish companies to get into the US. That's why we're keen to go over um, to Minnesota, because we'll be able to give the US hospitals products. Craneware, for example, a good example. Here's something that you won't get sued on. I just finally on that, that point that, that Scott raised there, um, Dr. Andrea Angeli and her evidence uh, told us quite clearly, I think, that the European Union doesn't have any comp competence in, in health-related services in any case, and that, that the risk doesn't come from TTIP because of that. Uh, so I, I take it from what she, she said to the committee was that if there is a risk to, to providing access to UK health services, then it's, it's a risk that the UK government has most influence over. That was my understanding of it. The European Union doesn't have any competence in that area to, to give that away as part of a TTIP agreement. Okay, that's what's conferred to Europe as yep. part of the member state. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Alec Rowley. Thanks. I mean, I, I think the perhaps a different way to come at this is what's in it for, for the US. Um, because I note Scott said there about the US walking away if, if, you know, if we stick hard and fast to regulation then in, in other areas and it may be I mean the point that David makes that in terms of tariffs for for your sector that that's important I think where we need to get to and it really is more for John in terms of um, whether there is more analysis that needs to be carried out and, and is, is, is it Scottish enterprise that needs to do that um, and what are the sort of key sectors that are that are exporting into the United States, um, what are the key sectors that, that, that would be influenced by this? If you mentioned earlier, for example, in terms of the American companies here, but perhaps not the best example was Amazon, you know, where, where if we look at the kind of employment standards in SDUC, we're, we're raising this when you talk about a race to the bottom, zero hours contracts. Now, it's true that across in Dunfermline right now, people are, are, are glad to be, be working. Um, and having, having an income of some sort coming into to the Christmas period, but that's not really the type of economy that we see for the future of Scotland. Surely it's about a, a, an economy that's a high-skilled, high-wage economy. And I can't help but think that in terms of regulation, go back a decade, and you know, politicians were lining up, as were others, to talk about the light touch regulation that we needed to have within the financial sector, and then we have a glo global economic crash and suddenly suddenly politicians are being blamed for, for that light touch. Um, so, so in terms of regulation, I think these are issues, if, if I can really pull it back to this, this question of transparency, for me it's, it's, it's not just the transparency, the negotiations themselves because that's important and I think David Martin and other MEPs that we took evidence for a few weeks ago said that there was greater transparency starting to come through. But it is the transparency of this whole agreement because there, it is raising concerns and the public are starting to become more interested in it. And hopefully the work of this committee, taking evidence for yourselves and others, will, will, will actually bring a greater transparency and understanding of what this agreement is about. Um, so, so, for example, I think... Alan, you, you, you and evidence talk about significant benefits to companies on both sides of the Atlantic, providing major boost in jobs and growth. My, my glass is always half full as well, but I think we need something a bit more that takes that a bit forward, because you do talk about raising global prosperity. Yet right across the globe, we have, we have widespread inequality, deprivation and poverty. And America is perhaps one of the most unequal countries in the world. Um, and people across Europe are starting to, I think, speak out about the levels of inequality that exists. So we do need the evidence to start backing that up. You, you know, it can't just be... Yeah. Well, motherhood and apple pie. No. Yeah. I, I, I appreciate that. 
but it, the point I've, I've made earlier, it's very difficult to, the, 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 the evidence shows that the, the reductions in tariffs will allow free, free trade to flow, which will benefit exporters in Scotland. Reductions in regulations will reduce the duplications of costs for companies who currently have to comply with European regulations and then are put off by the costs of considering going across the Atlantic. As John mentioned, it's a very, uh, it's a very big step to make to, to set up your business in the US, and it's quite daunting to do. And if you're facing increased costs on new regulations, you might put it off. But the harsh reality, unfortunately, is if you look at the economic picture currently, you're seeing the challenges in Greece and other parts of the EU where those economies are facing. Um, evidence of further slowdown. Thankfully, the American economy is continuing to grow a pace, which then gives us opportunities to take advantage of the, that growth. And Scotland has, um, as David mentioned, has built up great historic links with the US. So the opportunities are there to try and build those links. And the TTIP can help achieve it. Uh, I don't think it's, it isn't the issues raised over inequality and uh, any areas such as that. A trade agreement isn't going to be any stretch of imagination to tackle those kind of issues. But uh, it is interesting to consider why the Canadian trade agreement <coughs> hasn't raised anywhere near the same level of attention as the US-EU trade agreement. And on the 10th of January, the Glasgow City Council is hosting a dinner to commemorate the 200th anniversary of the birth of John Macdonald, the first Canadian Prime Minister. And Canadian foreign ministers have come up to try and um, push forward the benefits of trade between Scotland and Canada. Um, and it's a shame that TTIP has got criticised, I believe, unnecessarily. What about the regulation? Do you think that, that we are looking at more light touch regulation? The, the point that, was, that Scott has made is that it will be, be at the highest level of regulation. It won't, be, it won't be a rush to the bottom. It will be maintaining high regulation so that consumers have confidence in products. We now have a transparent consumer who is very concerned with what they buy. And I don't see any evidence that it will be a rush to the bottom. Regulations will be maintained at a high vigorous level, especially in the US, which has also been mentioned is a very litigious society. Alan, in, in your written evidence to, to the committee, you uh, raised some issues around about the investor state dispute mechanism, and, yeah. and we have had lots of um, evidence to this committee, whether yeah. even just in our Twitter feed, on very, very grave concerns about that. And you are saying, you know, in your evidence, that it's a way to protect, you know, um, and ensure that, that uh, businesses aren't, you know, discriminated against or whatever under, you know. Uh, change to legislation and regimes within yeah. the, the actual host state, yeah. for instance. But if you look at the, the Egyptian model where the Egyptian government increased their living wage, which maybe is, uh, is where uh, Alec is coming from as well, where they increased their living wage and then became subject to you know, a challenge on that and, and, you know, and, and costs related to that. Um, how, how do you marry these two things up that you know, this is a good thing and it protects people, but when states actually take action and like you know, bringing their, their, their minimum wage up, up to a, a better level, then that has an impact on that state? I think the point I made earlier about the figures that have happened in the UK, that there has not been one case against the UK which has been found against us, and there are 43 cases which have been taken by UK companies who have faced harmful changes to their regulations which have impacted upon their business and their jobs, that they have, they have been successful in it. And I don't think because one uh, business takes action against an Egyptian government, then that whole notion should be ruled out of hand and that overinflated fear should be given currency. Okay, okay, and I, and I, take, I take that on board uh, very much so, but let's just say in the Smith Commission, the Scottish Government eventually um, you know, negotiates um, the ability to, to you know, change the minimum wage to a living wage. Would that then make us subject to something like the Egyptian situation? It's unlikely because, I, with all due respect to the Egyptian economy, I don't think you're comparing like with like. The Scottish economy is a mature economy and we have good standards of pay and, 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 and and good um, working conditions in it. I take uh, Alex's point about to do our contracts and those kind of issues, but by and large, we have a, a, a workforce which is um, well regulated and, and actions in place, and I think it's highly unlikely that that kind of action would be seen in Scotland. Okay. okay. Alex, did you want to continue? Well, well, David's want to come in, but can I just... I want to pick this point. We, 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 we John, in terms of Scottish enterprise and whether they can do much more detailed analysis and give this committee more information on the companies that are trading in America and, and, and the likely benefits. And, and the, it's, it's about the threats as well. I think there's, yep, there's opportunity, but there's also threats. What are they? 
So I'd absolutely agree. Um, we do need to undertake with our partners in industry um, that robust economic analysis of the, the opportunities and the challenges um, uh, you know, as a result of this. So you know, I think that's something that we should definitely be doing with our partners. In terms of Scottish um, sectors exporting to the States, um, we've got some great examples. Financial services, we've got Aberdeen Asset Management, Martin Curry, Bailey Gifford out in the States. In terms of energy, we've got Agreco with significant operations in North America. Um, we've got the Weir Group with 80 operations in North America, employing 4,600 out there. Um, the Wood Group's US operations is the largest, um, um, uh, with 34% of their global headcount. Food and Drink, we've got Edrington, with five locations in the US. We've got Albert Bartlett and Sons, um, making deals around their rooster potatoes. And we've got yeah, small companies like Smarter Grid Solutions. So across the sectors, um, we've got Scottish companies you know, doing well and active, and of all sizes, um, you know, trading out in the States. Just uh, one final point, and it's energy, and that, that, that really raises a point in a sense. If you look at the, the American economy right now, um, shale gas is, 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 seems to be having a major influence in driving that economy, driving down oil prices, and certainly um, finishing the coal industry in this country. Now, the regulation of shale gas in America, I don't think, is up to the types of standards that are being talked about if shale gas proceeds in this country. Is, is that an example where, where, where there is a threat that American companies wanting to get in on shale gas here? And if we've got much tougher and tighter regulation, is that an example of conflict? I, I, I doubt it on the basis that the, um, the well, for example, the company that uh, John mentioned, the Weir Group, they are heavily involved in supplying into the shale gas boom in the US. So Scotland's benefiting from the shale gas boom and, and, and the engineering manufacturing sector is benefiting from that currently. And we are all benefiting as consumers and reductions in the petrol prices of the, of, of the shale gas boom. But I, I don't see any reason why there would be a change in regulations to allow um, a flood of US companies in to, to, um, to take out uh, whatever shale gas exists in, in Scotland, I think that's highly unlikely. David. Okay. Thank you. Uh, it was just a, a general point, just because um, it's been touched on a couple of times. I mean, part of the challenge here is, of course, we're still in negotiation, and so we don't actually know what the end point of that is, and that creates uh, questions and uncertainty, and that, that's understandable. I think, therefore, it's certainly worth studying the EU-Canada agreement, um, because um, Due to TTIP, that got over the line. That set the benchmark for what a next generation free trade agreement looks like. That's probably the sort of uh, area that TTIP will end up in, perhaps going further. But in terms of trying to understand what will be in that agreement, if the negotiation comes to a conclusion, uh, the Canadian agreement is certainly worth uh, taking the time to understand. And certainly when it comes to regulation and standards, that was about levelling up than more than anything else. Yeah, we, we've, we've had some briefing from our very helpful SPICE people on some of the other trade agreements, but uh, maybe just drawing our attention to the Canadian one is, is, is very helpful. Thank you. Um, I, I'm conscious of the time now, and we're, we're sort of a due to finish this session with, with you now, because we've got other business to get on with. But is there any final comments or questions, Rod? Just, just wanted to follow through. We were talking about ISDS. I think Mr. Martin, uh, MEP, in, uh, in his uh, evidence session with us, suggested that um, uh, TTIP might be possible without ISDS provisions. I just wondered what the panel's view were, was. Uh, would they think that ISDS is such a fundamental part of this agreement or could it be removed and we could then have a just TTIP on its own? I think it's unlikely for the reasons I outlined earlier that in order to avoid regulatory changes by governments which would negatively impact on businesses then they'd, they'd, they would wish to have that kind of, that kind of protection for their, for their workers and their, uh, and their businesses. Okay, any final points? Just, just one. Hans um, There was an earlier point raised that, you know, why would the, the U.S. be interested in us? And I think it's quite clear that uh, they would be guaranteed a, um, a quality. They would be guaranteed a workforce that has uh, reasonable working hours and, and conditions to work in terms of health and safety so that they, would, they themselves or their uh, retailers wouldn't be prosecuted in courts. 
So we we give them something very valuable, uh, and and all and they do to, they do to us. The whole point of the the U.S. wanting to trade with Europe is is quite clearly they're they're looking to ensure that they safeguard their their citizens, and that's what we intend to provide. But it works both ways, and I think what we need to try and make sure, uh, particularly in Scotland, is that we do provide something quite unique and special. And, and uh, I mean, and it's not just whiskey. I mean, uh, you can go from Aran cheese to yogurts to you know, we can provide stuff that nobody else in the world can provide, and and that. I mean, if I, a layman, can recognize that, I'm sure in international business communities will also recognize. And I think, therefore, there is a call, and I think there's a greater call for us to try and make sure that we press home that message and we do uh, look at ways of enhancing our position in terms of how we trade there. We like there because we are their cousins. So, you know, let's, let's deal with that on those bases. Let's not say it's too difficult and it's too complicated. I think that those are just challenges and we should, we should face up to them. I think just to, to, to finalise this, this session and to, to add to that point, the, the Scots have always liked a, a good deal anyway, but were rather canny and that's why this committee is looking at every aspect of, of this agreement um, because you'll understand that over the summer we were lobbied very heavily on the negativity of, of the, the process, so it's been very, very valuable to hear you know, the possible opportunities in that um, and some of the, the pitfalls, but certainly you know, um, your experience and your input has been very, very important in informing that process. Now, this inquiry is going to continue on well into the new year, um, and we are very, very keen to hear from yourselves if you have additional information or from anyone you know in, the, in, in your sectors that, that would maybe have you know, something peculiar or something a bit different or you know, something that could inform us as, as further or anyone wider that you think should, should inform our processes as well would be extremely helpful uh, in that. And I mean, just a wee gentle uh, prod to Scottish Enterprise. I think you've got some homework to do and we'll look forward to hearing from you on that homework in, in the near, near future um, but thank you very much for your, your uh, involvement in our committee this morning and, and hopefully we'll look forward to hearing from you in the future thank you um, I'm going to suspend uh, to allow the committee to go into private now and can I thank everyone for coming along